Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. When I was 16, I was at my parents' cabin near the Olympic National Park, Lake Kokanee. My friend Sean and I went down to the rope swing, which was about 200 yards downhill from the house. We had decided to call it a day and were putting our shoes and shirts on for the short hike back up the hill. As we got ready to go, we could hear something approaching from the north of us. This all happened in a short period of time, but it seemed like an eternity. Immediately, we could tell it was on two feet, assuming that it was a person. I thought they were jumping from foot to foot. The strides were very far apart. I called out twice, who's there? Who's there? There was no reply. As it got closer, I could hear branches breaking underfoot. Looking back, this thing was very large. The brush there is very dense. On the side of the hill, so we could not see what was coming. When it was no more than 40 yards away, I could see it. It swept back a vine maple and looked at us like it was surprised. It's very hard to explain, but it looked like a person in a way. It was not as tall as I heard that they were, maybe seven feet at the most. It had very wide shoulders and was very muscular. I did not smell a foul odor. Its face did look somewhat human. I think it's the way it looked at us. Anyway, almost as soon as we had seen it, we both turned and ran up the hill, grabbing branches to pull our way up. I never looked back, but I thought I could hear it chasing us for a short distance. I never went down that hill again. Sean and I had been swimming and playing on a rope swing. It was about noon. The area is pine forest, very steep hillside, a lot of animal paths zigzag along the slope, very dense brush from thin trees, letting light to the forest floor. Most of the forest in the park is not like that. On to the next one. My husband and I found a series of five footprints in a dried-up boggy area about one and a half to two miles past Jefferson Lake in Hamahama Recreation in Jefferson County. The prints were 19 inches long and 10 inches wide at the ball of the foot. Previous to finding the footprint, we had been about a mile further up the mountain at a small pond. The pond is very secluded and on one side, the side across from us, was a steep bank with thick vegetation. While we sat at the edge of the pond, we heard loud brush movement, followed by a loud crack as from a large limb breaking. We watched the other side of the pond, hoping to see what was making so much noise. Our thoughts were a large animal with as much weight as a bear or an elk. As we sat from time to time, there would be more rustling of brush, followed by the loud crack of a limb breaking, but whatever was there never showed itself or left. I sat there for 30 to 45 minutes. My husband, growing bored, began working his way around the pond. About halfway around, he began smelling a strong, unpleasant odor. We both felt a strong unease. He came back and we left. We didn't put this incident together with finding the print a very short time later. Till after researching the print, we found and reading about other people's encounters with Bigfoot. After finding the print, we went to the ranger station in Hoodsport, and they told the lady there about the prints we had found. She laughed, said with a wink that it must have been our Sasquatch. We felt a little silly and left. I continued to talk about what we had found to friends who were mostly disbelieving, but my boss at work said that it was too bad I hadn't made a plaster cast of it. I hadn't thought of that, 
The next Saturday, September 5th, we brought a bag of plaster and returned. The prints were still undisturbed, so we made a cast and also took pictures of the print. It was my husband and myself. We had stopped to take a picture of a mountain in Thornton's Peak. I was looking at the terrain and seeing what animals had left track, as I often do. We found the print late afternoon, near the end of a long, dry summer. In this dry season, it was a dried-up, boggy area. It was in a low spot, surrounded by steep hills on two sides, and a dry creek on the other side. The whole area is surrounded by the Olympic Mountains. On to the next one. This happened in Pacific County in Washington. On the day after Christmas, I and my ex-husband were driving on the Deep River Main Line headed toward Nacelle, Washington. At the time, my ex had an old Mercury Cougar, so you know that the front end of the vehicle was pretty big in width. The time of the day was evening, and it was pretty dark, and the only light was coming from the car headlight. And it was snowing, too. So, as we were heading to our destination, we saw something leap from one side to the other. I knew that a bear couldn't have done that, because, first, they are in hibernation, and if they weren't, it would have taken more than one leap to get it across that narrow back road, and especially in front of a moving vehicle. And yes, it was bigger than a bear. It was pretty fast, like a blur. It happened at night, it was snowy conditions, and an old logging road called the Deep River Main Line. It was an old logging trail with dirt roads and hills. Also, some of the natives talk about the Hungry Man Highway or Road, known for its many accidents. Before you get there, there is an old cemetery. I believe it's a national memorial. Another person reported shortly after I told him what I saw. He stated that he and a friend were in their vehicle at the beginning of the Deep River Mainland Road, just sitting when something shook the vehicle. On to the next one. Near Molson in Okanagan County in Washington, I rode to work one morning with my boss while logging just off the Canadian-Washington border. We were parked at a landing, waiting for it to get light enough to start. My boss stepped out of the pickup and said, Bigfoot? I said, what? I went to his side of the truck to see what he was looking at. There was tracks about 15 to 16 inches long. I put my feet in them and fell about two feet short of the next one, maybe five or six feet apart. The tracks continued like that as far as I could see. We were leaving at dark every day and arriving before light, and it was snowing just about every day or night. These tracks were fresh. My boss had seen Bigfoot while he was logging in the Olympic Peninsula and was convinced they were Sasquatch. I wasn't sure just yet. Later, while working, I got a chill up my spine and the hair on the back of my head stood up like it does on a dog or cat when they sense something. I began flipping my head side to side, trying to see something, but couldn't see anything. But it sure felt like I was being watched. Every now and then, I would find an animal upwind. Could have been a wolf. I spotted one in the area. I did hear what sounded like someone banging a stick on a tree. I followed the sound, expecting to find a woodpecker, but see nothing. We were seeing around 15 to 20 deer a day before that, and hadn't seen any after that day. A truck driver coming up for a load told us you should have seen all the deer leaving the hill. There must have been 30, maybe 40 down by the road. I thought it could have been wolf pushing them down, or they just had enough snow. There was three feet on the ground in places, and temperature was 15 below zero. I asked a friend who logged in Idaho for years if he ever had the hair on the back of his head stand up while in the woods. He said only one. He was running and saw a Bigfoot walk up behind him. I believe Bigfoot was watching us. 
There was a record snowfall that year. A lot of deer didn't make it. My boss and I were the only ones to see. We were more concerned with the work. Everything took place throughout the day. It was very cold. Typical winter day. On to the next one. I was staying for the week in some accommodations by Marpole Lake, from which each day took a hike in a different direction in order to fully absorb and take in the gorgeous scenery that was to be had in the region. I spent my first day hiking around Twin Falls and Little Yoho River, and the weather couldn't have been finer. It was on day two that I headed south, first investigating Laughing Falls, after which I headed south passing the campground below Daly Glacier and relaxing by Takaka Falls for several hours before turning back to camp. The sights and sounds of this location being nothing less than breathtaking, with the Yoho River always in view, running to the north and south of me. It was on day three that I headed northeast, with my destination being Fairy Lake and Troll Tinder Mountain which I was told by the folks running the accommodations was knocked down gorgeous to behold, and so I left. Having reached Fairy Lake, and now sitting alongside of it, this body of water and its surroundings were aptly named by whoever had penned the name. Have you ever been somewhere and said to yourself, I could build a little cabin here and be content for the rest of my days? Well, this was that kind of place, and as I sat by the lake, the biblical narrative was ringing through my very soul, which says, Eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of man, the things that God has in store for those who love him. It was just incredible. After a while, I walked over toward what was the base of Troll Tinder Mountain, when I heard a large and resounding crash of what I was certain was a tree falling in the woods. It came down with a thud, hitting the ground in such a way that told me it was very close. At this point, I was standing very still and looking in the direction of the noise when I saw some color passing through an opening in the brush, just up the very fringes of the mountain's base, and I watched. Moments later, what was an enormous Sasquatch emerged from the trees, walking southeast toward Lilliput Mountain, and I quickly ducked behind some bushes, not wanting to be seen. I watched this monster walk for about a hundred yards, appearing and disappearing within the trees, and it was gone. I thought to myself, it must have been it that knocked down the tree, but for what reason, I did not know. It hadn't seen me and was casually walking when I had set eyes on it. To my eyes, it appeared to be some ten feet tall, and its hair was rust-covered and matted at the rump. The body was broad and almost cylindrical in shape, being as wide in the hips as it was in the chest. As it walked, the outer skin and hair seemed to shift and slide over the muscles, just like that of a large grizzly would do. Its arms swung like the pendulum in a grandfather clock, moving in perfect unison with every step which it took and then it was gone. Although nothing had occurred in the form of a threat, as soon as it had ducked back into the trees, I left that place in a hurry. When I got back to where I was staying and told them what I had seen, the woman said to me, you saw what we joke about being the hairy fairy. Many people have reported seeing the very same creature which you just saw. As I walked away, I thought to myself, now that's some kind of fairy. On to the next one. This event happened when I was still a law professor and the university would not have approved of one of their faculty reporting on such a controversial subject. So I've kept it to myself. This incident happened to me and my wife Penny on a camping trip in northern Idaho and for years I've wanted to tell somebody besides my close circle of friends it's good to see that there are others out there who've had the same thrill of discovery, but at the same time, 
It's too bad we can only share it safely with those who can believe in it, because we have all shared the experience. Penny and I had always wanted to camp somewhere that was so remote that we could only realize total privacy with only the forest dwellers to share it with. To experience this solitude, we wanted to find our adventure in truly wild area, within sight of civilization, but only from a long ways up. We traveled to Idaho's Lake Ponderé. The place we had chosen to begin our adventure was off Lakeview Road, and we parked our vehicle on a remote curve in this road, where we could pull off far enough behind some pine trees so as to be totally hidden from the road. Then we loaded up two monstrous backpacks and headed into the Coer de la National Forest in the direction of Echo Bay of Bernard Point. We had stayed overnight in a motel back down the highway so as to get an early start. And with many rest stops to accommodate an out-of-shape law professor, we spent the long summer day hiking northeast until we found a place suitable for an overnight camp. The next morning, we arose to a loud, rapping sound that we assumed must have been a woodpecker working on a tree full of bugs. That was a suitable alarm clock. So we prepared a quick cold breakfast, packed up our gear, and then headed through the heavy and deep forest again toward the lake. By mid-afternoon, we had selected our perfect camp, a flat grassy spot surrounded by a beautiful evergreen and oak forest with a stream of sparkling water running alongside a tent site that seemed to have been created just for us. We cleared the area, put up our tent, and dug a latrine down below our camp in a small circle of young pines. To reward ourselves, we took a short hike up to the peak in order to view the lake. Lake Ponderé is the largest body of water in Idaho. That night, as we were relaxing before a picturesque campfire, we again heard a distant rapping, only this time we knew it could not have been a woodpecker because the sun had set and it was already pitch black in the inner forest. The sound was like someone smacking a baseball bat on a hollow tree, which I had done before. It's a sort of deep reverberating sound. The noise would consist of a half dozen or so raps and then silence for a time, and suddenly there was an answering series of similar sounds way off in the opposite direction from where we were at. It was unnerving, but we weren't frightened. We simply had a sense that someone or something was communicating, like a mating ritual or something. Penny and I discussed possibilities which ran the gambit from bulk elk claiming their territory and even to the possibility of a group of the type that had established a neo-Nazi encampment near this area years before, but had finally been run out by the federal government. There are some very remote areas of northern Idaho, and at least we knew that humans could not navigate these forests without light, so we could at least rest knowing that only animals could come close, and bear or cougar would likely stay away from humans. Not hearing any more sounds other than an owl, and far-off howls and yipping of what sounded like a pack of young coyotes, we slept peacefully. The next morning, we woke with the sun and stepped out of the tent to greet the day. But something was different. The coffee pot was not by the fire pit. It was lying under a large tree, and my backpack had been removed from the stub of branch on the large fir tree that I had hung it on. We found it down the hill below camp and behind a thick stand of blackberry bushes, and it had been opened. The zippers had broken as if someone had pulled it apart without using the zippers. The contents had been removed as though someone or something without knowledge of zippers and fasteners had used enormous strength to rip it apart. Several of the MRIs, meals ready to eat, had been torn apart. The contents poured and scattered about, and it was like a big, strong creature had been carelessly inspecting the contents. A bag of marshmallows was torn open, and it appeared that most of them had been eaten or at least carried off, but the torn bag remained. After we cleaned up the mess and prepared breakfast, 
I went to the stream to fill the pot that we boiled water in and Penny visited the latrine when, on her way back, she yelled, Paul, come over here, look at this. When I got to her, she was leaning over a spot in the creek, just staring at the sandy shore by the water's edge. There were two huge footprints that appeared to be about one and a half time larger than my size 11 and a half hiking boot. The prints looked human, except for the obvious claw-like mark at their tip. We had heard of Bigfoot before, but like most people, we casually dismissed the reports as most likely bears and wishful thinking of wannabe adventurers. However, this was different. It really had happened, and to two fairly educated people. Penny is a high school principal, so there we were, trying to rationalize a bear that left humanoid footprints and that lifted my backpack quietly off a tree branch five feet high and went through it with us only 20 feet away. Well, we cleaned up the area and stayed close to camp all that day rather than hike up to view the lake again. Later that afternoon, we heard a series of raps again that sounded like whatever it was had moved closer to our camp. Still, later on, we were startled by an even louder series of beats and they seemed a lot closer to us. But this time, we had begun to feel most unwelcome, and we reached a point where the enjoyment of nature had lost its appeal. So, we warily camped again that night, and the next day found us rapidly hiking back to our vehicle. Our GPS unit returned us to the welcome site of our car, and we heaved a sigh of relief when the engine started immediately. We had been concerned about that as we were really anxious to just get out. Then, as we were crawling along our meandering trail back to the Gravel County Road, a creature darted across the road about 50 yards ahead of us, and we both concluded it had to be a bear running on its hind legs. Then we ruled out that possibility as it looked too much like a large ape. But it didn't seem to have a neck. We hadn't seen it for more than seconds, and it was angled toward us, so the shock of it seemed to blur our memories. We never spoke much about this incident, and only to a very close circle of friends. Usually, we keep it light to leave room for the ribbing that's always followed. But we had experienced something that compels a person to want to share it. Now that I'm retired and I have time to explore... I no longer have the desire to chase out and find this elusive beast. On to the next one. On a hot, sticky summer evening in central Maryland, a blue Nissan Pathfinder hurtled hastily down a curvy country road. It was Wednesday, piano lesson day for 14-year-old Sandra Coopler. Sandra's father, Mike, was driving her from the nearby suburb to an area of big farms and fields for the weekly piano lesson with Miss Carter, a former conservatory pianist now living on the farm property with her husband, Dill, and providing lessons to students of all ages in her home studio. The division of labor at the Carter residence was rather pronounced. Dill Carter tended to the crops Caroline Carter tended to the future Beethovens. Mike, a nearing middle-aged man, a fairly short stature and a slight paunch, and Sandra, a bright teen girl with long strawberry blonde hair, were racing to make the 7 p.m. lesson appointment with Miss Carter. It was about 6.57, and they weren't quite to the farm yet, despite having rapidly passed a milk tanker truck while in one of the dotted line-passing zones of Route 31. The rural road was tree-lined in spots with groups of large oaks, maples, and willows separated by expansive open fields of corn, alfalfa, and other vegetables. How's the Bach piece coming along? asked Mike of Sandra. Sandra had been working on Bach's Italian concerto in F minor for a couple of weeks and didn't quite have it refined yet. She wasn't particularly looking forward to performing it in front of Mrs. Carter today. It's kind of lousy right now, replied Sandra, straightforwardly. I'm having some trouble with the second section. Ah, uh, you'll get it, said Mike, attempting a tone of encouragement. 
Sandra didn't mind the attempt, although she knew her dad had no idea how much focus and repetition it took to get a classical piece of music just right. She looked down at her phone screen and said, and will probably be late again, to her father with some resignation. Hmm, was his only reply, issued with a slight self-directed growl. On Route 31, about a mile past the country fairgrounds in wide open land, was a big mailbox with a black toy grand piano affixed to its top and a carved wooden rooster head jutting out of the mailbox front door. This signified the slightly bipolar Carter residence, encompassing both keys and crops. Turning right at the mailbox, Mike scooted onto and down the unpaved gravel driveway. The farmhouse was quite a distance back from the mailhouse. The driveway was extremely long and dusty, taking one slight curve to the right around a farm pond and some trees, then continuing for about another eighth of a mile to the Carter's farmhouse. Large, leafy trees ring the backside of the property. Mike Kubler liked the idea of keeping his pathfinder clean, but the weekly visit to the Carter farm made Mike's hopes for automotive cleanliness continually futile. After rolling down the long gravel driveway on this dry evening, the pathfinder picked up a healthy coating of dust, particularly at the back of the vehicle. Oh well. The Carter farmhouse was a good-sized two-story home, situated not far from a green barn. It was clear which structure belonged to whom. The farmhouse reflected the refined, elegant sensibilities of a woman, while the barn housed a tractor, tools, fertilizer bags, and other accoutrements of agricultural activity. Mike and Sandra came to a stop in front of the house, and Sandra took a quick jump out of the SUV and jogged toward her lesson, carrying her music book. This was always a somewhat anxious moment for Sandra, particularly when she and her dad were on the late side of things. Back in the car, Mike sat still for a few moments and caught his breath after yet another dad duty done, if not gracefully or quite on time. After a few minutes, Mike followed Sandra into a side door of the house. Within a sizable foyer with a slate floor, wicker-style furniture, and large potted house plant served as a waiting area for the piano parents, while double wooden doors closed during lessons led to Miss Carter's music studio. As in a medical office, small stacks of magazines for those who are in the wait were situated on the end tables between chairs. Miss Carter's music studio was a pleasant, expansive air-conditioned room with tan walls and large windows that let in plenty of sunlight, along with the views of the farm and the woods beyond. Studio adornments, including the requisite mementos of a musical life, two music degree diplomas on the wall, a stackable music rack with numerous songbooks, metronomes, and other instructional devices, and a few small ornamental bursts of Mozart, Beethoven, and other great composers perched atop cabinets. Against the back wall was a brown seven-foot Kawai concert grand piano. The large instrument was situated such that entering the room and walking toward the piano would bring one straight to the keyboard, a direct inviting path to music making. Sandra sat up straight on the piano bench, finishing her performance of her Bach concerto. Miss Carter sat immediately next to her in a separate chair, listening and observing closely. Carolyn Carter was a slight, lean woman with dark shoulder-length hair. Wearing a khaki pair of shorts and a floral patterned short sleeve top, she was neat, studious-looking, and alert with her dark-rimmed glasses and a red pen in hand. After Sandra finished the Bach piece, Miss Carter marked up several sections and offered advice on how Sandra might get through the tougher section a bit more smoothly. However, even though she was exacting in her instructions and expectations of the students, she also had a good sense of humor and strove to maintain a friendly rapport, not wanting to inhabit the cranky, ego-driven educator category. 
Well, I guess that's all the fun for this week, she said in a chipper fashion to Sandra, standing up to emphasize the lesson's closure. She added, Oh, and on the Chopin Walt, try to watch those tempo marks. You don't want Frederick to leave you in the ditch on that one. Sandra giggled slightly and let out a breath of relief at the lesson's end. Okay, I'll do that, she said to Mrs. Carter. A student and teacher walked toward the double doors to the foyer. Miss Carter opened one of the doors and saw her husband Dill standing next to Sandra's father, clearly immersed in a rather serious exchange. And so, we all need to be a little careful, Dill was saying to Mike at the apparent conclusion of a discussion. Dill was a tall, well-built man with a fairly prominent nose and just a bit of gray showing at the ends of his short brown hair. A baseball cap in hand, he looked over a pair of glasses that were well down his nose as he spoke earnestly to Sandra's father. Mrs. Carter hesitated to broach what she thought might be the apparent topic among the men, but she did it anyway. So, what's up, Dill? All was quiet for a few moments between the four people. It's that thing we've been hearing, and other folks have seen over the last few weeks, Dill finally said to the group. Sandra quickly realized that she had no idea at all what the adults were talking about. Her father clued Sandra into the discussion after seeing her understandable lack of comprehension. They'd been encountering a, a creature here recently, and Mr. Carter was recommending some caution as we're coming and going, Mike said. A creature? exclaimed Sandra, as if she could have asked anything else. Yes, began Dill. We don't want to scare you too much, but there's something big around here. That got my neighbors pretty spooked. One neighbor lost a few chickens to it, and another guy had his two dogs so scared that he can barely get them outside now, Dill explained. What do you think it is? Sandra directly asked Dill. More strained silence ensued. Caroline Carter looked particularly uncomfortable at having to impart news of a disturbing, fully mysterious threat. She tipped her head down and idly scratched at her ear. Some think it's a migrating Bigfoot or something that at least temporarily hanging around, said Dill at last. A Bigfoot, said Sandra quickly, looking to her father with amazement, eyes fully wide. Mrs. Carter strove to add some perspective. I've never been a believer in the legend, she said with obvious reluctance, but we've been hearing sounds at night that are unlike any sound I've ever heard long, mournful howls that have incredible power and duration to them. Dill and I have always been around animals, but this is something else entirely. But you still haven't seen it, asked Mike. No, we've had no visuals to date, said Dill. Just the howls at night right here. But the neighbors have seen a huge, dark figure right at the tree line at dusk. Then, right after, they heard the same sort of howls as we did, coming out of the forest. He paused for a few moments, then added. Plus, Jim Chappelle had a chicken coop ripped open and raided. Wow, exclaimed Sarah, who had some scant knowledge of Bigfoot, but didn't know what to expect should there be one in the vicinity. A, a monster right here? Well, we're not completely sure, began Mrs. Carter, but we want everyone to keep their eyes open when they're in the area. Mr. Kubler wasn't quite on board with the neighborhood monster theory. Uh, there's no way I buy into the Bigfoot stories, he said. But if you guys think there might be a threat, then sure, we'll look out. And we just heard it last night, added Dill, looking especially downcast over having to remind everyone of the proximity of the potential menace. More silence ensued as each individual settled further into the highly unusual nature of the discussion and what it might mean for each of them. Well then, said Mike, I guess we'll get going. Thanks, I guess. He offered an uncertain sideways grin to the Carters and put his arm around Sandra, who was carrying her music book. They headed out the side door as they took their first step into the very fragrant, late evening air of the country, both Sandra and Mike reflectively scanned the area visually. 
their steps were a bit quicker than usual as they headed for the SUV. In fact, Sandra nervously ran the last few steps to the car. Back inside, Carolyn had a tense discussion with Dill as they walked toward their kitchen. Do you think we really should have told them about it? She asked. Dill thought for several moments. Yeah, he started. I figured Mike might not believe me, but I'd be remiss if I didn't tell them to at least be aware of their surroundings here. I don't know what that thing's capable of or what it's really after. As the weight of the situation sunk further into Caroline's consciousness, she said, I just feel terrible about scaring a young girl like that when we're not 100% sure what we're dealing with. I feel bad too, said Dill. But I'd feel worse if something happened and we hadn't told them about this darn thing. Caroline at once experienced an ugly, unpleasant jolt in the pit of her stomach. Oh God, I need a drink, she said finally. Since Sandra's was the last lesson of the day and the workday on the farm had ended some time before, Caroline and Dill headed for the liquor cabinet together to address their mutual discomfort. Mike and Sandra were now rolling down the Carter's long driveway toward Route 31. It was nearly dark, and although the landscape was a deep green and beautiful in the fading sunlight, a palpable feeling of dread enveloped both the car's passengers. Do you really think it's possible? asked Sandra. Mike hesitated several seconds. I don't know, probably not, but the Carters are some smart people and they'd have no reason to make something like that up, he reasoned out loud. The rest of the world seemed to have temporarily dropped away as father and daughter each thought through various Sasquatch scenarios. You know, your box sounded darn good to me tonight, said Mike, out of the blue, striving to summon additional encouragement while also trying to change the subject. Sandra would have none of it. What would a Bigfoot do with chickens, Sandra went on to ask, obviously still reviewing the Carter's account in her mind. Um, eat them, I guess, answered Mike as the car neared the big bend in the driveway. Envisioning Bigfoot poultry violence, Sandra got a chill on this otherwise hot, humid night. Just as they approached the clump of trees at the leftward bend of the gravel driveway, they both observed an extremely large, dark man seemingly come out of nowhere, taking huge strides and crossing the driveway from right to left in two steps, only about 30 feet in front of the car. The man lowered his head somewhat and swiftly ducked into the trees adjacent to the pond. Having barely missed the figure with his SUV, Mike yelled, Holy jeez! At the same moment, Sandra let out a short scream at the imposing, confusing, unexpected sight. Mike instinctively jammed hard on the brakes and the SUV began skidding roughly in the gravel, the wheels having largely come to a stop, although the car was still moving. Fortunately, the car wasn't traveling too quickly, so Mike turned a bit to the right and the car slid noisily through the rocks and off the driveway, coming to a stop and skidding askew in some long grass. The SUV's engine, now somewhat mechanically traumatized, stalled and went quiet. Sandra and Mike briefly sat in stunned silence as all motion ceased, except for the billowing of a big cloud of dust caused by the skidding vehicle. It was almost shocking quite for a moment after the car came to a complete stop and the engine shut down. With hearts racing, Mike and Sandra tried to regain their senses and figure out what to do. Who was that? asked Sandra. Mike sat still for several seconds with hands tightly gripping the steering wheel, trying to look through the dust cloud toward the trees in order to assess the situation. He ultimately said, I think it may have been the visitor that the Carters were talking about. Now that her initial, although self-denied impression of the figure was confirmed in reality by her father, Sandra was totally terrified. The norms of suburban and rural life had been shattered by the appearance of something scary from an unknown realm, and it was right behind the small stand of trees next to the family SUV. As the dust began to clear, it soon became clear to the two people in the car that they were not alone 
at this otherwise beautiful spot of evening's end in the country. Both Sandra and Mike had their windows most of the way down, and the sound each of them then heard with total clarity sent daggers through their nervous systems. The roar started at a very low pitch, but within three or four seconds began to rise up to a combination of a weightlifter's yell and a lion's aggressive outburst. It was coming from the trees right next to the car. Both Sandra and Mike instantly felt all their muscles clench in a shocking reaction to the gargantuan growl. Neither of them had heard any sounds like this in their lives. The deep roar rippled across the landscape with such sonic power that it seemingly stopped all the bird chirping, cicada buzzing, and spring pepper frog frolicking within several miles. Sandra and Mike essentially were frozen by the monstrous sound. Dad, we need to go, cried Sandra loudly. Mike was still utterly stunned and virtually insensate after the powerful jolt of Sasquatch infrasound struck him. He struggled to gather himself and resume operating the vehicle. He reached toward the ignition key, but his wobbly hand aimlessly impacted the dashboard without constructive result. Come on, Dad, Sandra strongly implored as her dad continued to fumble with the controls. Just then, Sandra glanced in her passenger side rearview mirror and got the overwhelming shock of her life. The gigantic creature had apparently circled back out of the trees and was now striding purposefully up behind the car. In other words, an object in the mirror was definitely closer than it appeared. Daddy, go, Sandra screamed with every ounce of vocal energy she could muster. The urgency of this child-emitted directive finally pushed Mike out of his stupor and into action. He successfully grabbed the key and turned it and pressed down on the gas pedal. Fortunately, the Pathfinder roared to life once more. Sandra felt immeasurable relief upon hearing the engine start. Unfortunately, she simultaneously looked in the mirror again and did not appreciate the image therein. What she saw in the mirror was a seven or eight foot tall bipedal creature that was moving forward with a driven, insistent force and a palpable sense of predatory power. The creature was far bigger than any man or woman Sandra had ever seen in her life. It had long, dark brown or black hair from head to foot, flowing backward as the creature ran. Its large, clearly visible face was human-like, though also gorilla-like, a cross between the known and the wild. But the animal's enormity was the most mind-blowing characteristic of this beast for Sandra. The sight was straight out of a nightmare. But here it was, right by a picturesque farmhouse after a piano lesson. Sandra could clearly make out the creature's huge leg and arm muscles as it ran forward toward the as yet motionless car. The creature now produced a low, continuous bouncing growl as it neared the vehicle. Just after the car roared to life, Sandra began to scrunch down in her seat because of the charging creature was now so very close to her. Just beyond the passenger side open window, Mike punched the gas and the back of the car swished as the vehicle strove to gain traction. The SUV quickly lurched forward and went around the driveway bend by the trees. Dust and gravel flew everywhere behind the car. Oh God, thanks, Dad, Sandra yelled over the whining, accelerating engine. Focusing on trying to steer the car accurately, Mike soon deadpanned. Yeah, no problem at all, honey. Despite the car having managed forward progress, Sandra quickly realized that they were not out of the woods yet, so to speak. Upon looking in the rearview mirror again, Sandra saw that the forest creature had aggressively sped up and caught the SUV. It was right behind the car now, and Sandra could see a seemingly angry face atop a gigantic monster body charging forward. This wasn't in any way over. Suddenly, Mike and Sandra experienced a deeply uncomfortable lurch as Visible to Sandra in the mirror, the agile creature reached out, spread its arms, and pushed down on the back of the vehicle with its big hand. The human's heads bounced violently backward as the powerful downward force was exerted upon the car. 
The terror inspired by the jolt from the monster's muscles was immediately disoriented to both car passengers. Thoughts of imminent death materialized quickly. Upon regaining his equilibrium, somewhat after the startling downward jolt, Mike basically floored it as he steered the car toward the end of the driveway. The monster was still intently pursuing them. Mike sped up. Finally, as they approached the end of the driveway, Sandra could see the monster had fallen back. Fifty or eighty feet behind the SUV, it was still running at full tilt, but, as Sandra hoped, nearing the end of its pursuit, with the car beginning to get out of reach. Thank goodness for direct fuel injection and thick cylinders in the SUV engine. Now the mailbox was straight ahead. Knowing he'd need to make a very agile left-hand turn, Mike swung just a little toward the right of the driveway and, upon arriving at the piano, Rooster mailbox executed a skillful leftward swing of the car without stopping to view the cross traffic as prescribed by proper vehicular protocol out onto Route 31. The physical relief was immediate for both Mike and Sandra as they felt the tires finally gripped solid pavement beneath the vehicle. Sandra turned back and took one last look backward, this time through the rear seat window of the car behind her father. The Bigfoot had pulled up to a halt just prior to the mailbox and seemed to be relegated to watching the vehicle escape its grasp. Sandra saw the creature stop and lower its fist down towards its knees to issue one final aggressive roar. Even though the car's engine was working hard, Sandra and Mike both heard the Sasquatch's roar atop it. The sound was both angry and desolate, indicating that the uncertain motivation of the creature as it pursued father and daughter down the dust-driven driveway. Even from a distance, the Sasquatch sound was like a gut punch. Had the creature been hungry for humans, or was it partial to Bach and simply wanted to hear more music, or did it dislike the blue Nissan vehicle? No one could know for sure at this point. However, at this moment, the prospect of likely survival was the most satisfying feeling Sandra had experienced thus far in her young life. Mike was still totally focused on directing the car at high speeds toward safety, Neither he nor Sandra verbalized anything for a minute or two as they hurtled down Route 31 toward home. The car's engine was getting quite a workout as it propelled the vehicle toward the familiar structures and shapes of the suburb. Finally, Sandra said to her father in a low, quiet voice, Uh, I can't believe that just happened. She was still shaking all over. Mike exhaled deeply and felt his tense muscles relax just a little bit. He felt tears forming at the edge of his eyes. Me neither, sweetheart, he said. Mike reached over with his right hand and gently caressed the back of Sarah's neck. She closed her eyes and reveled in the familiar, reassuring touch. Having driven another mile or so in silence, Mike abruptly piped up in a perky manner. You know, Sandy, I'm getting really tired of Bach, he said, with a feigned air of authority analysis. I don't think will be coming out for piano lessons for a while, okay? Sandra simply replied, That's music to my ears, Dad. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!